Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CSL, the spring semester of the 2017-2018 season. My name is Wivrex. I am joined, finally, it has been all semester, and I get to have a game here casted with the Wonder Cow himself, Gorgon. I feel like the prettiest girl at the ball, Wivrex. You always know just what to say. Of course. Of course. And Gorgon, we are bringing today to these wonderful viewers the Stony Brook versus Alberta game. Uh, this is in conference number two. Now, both of these teams are doing pretty good in the second semester. Um, Stony Brook, I believe. Yeah, Stony Brook has not lost a game, uh, but they did have a bye already. Uh, so they are 2-0, and oh, whereas Alberta is 2-1 and one in the second semester. That's, uh, I mean, this should be a very good game. I'm, the, both teams are coming in with a similar play history. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't think I actually recognize any of the players unless they've changed their name from the last two seasons. I think these might be all new players. So that by itself makes this a very interesting matchup. Yeah, and then the the numbers shift a little bit when you look at their full season records. Uh, Stony Brook 7-2, and two, so a pretty impressive win rate there. Uh, Alberta 5-4, and four, so hovering just about at that 50%. We'll be going into the draft in just a moment, uh, but before we get there, I believe both of these teams are still in contention for playoffs, so Alberta really needs a win here if they hope to keep their playoff dreams alive. Yeah, well, I mean, you got to come in ready to play. You got to come in and play to your advantages, play to the sorts of heroes and metas that you're comfortable with. And, you know, a lot of the teams that get to this stage in the semester and remaining. struggle or get to this stage in the semester with that Dial kind of pressure, back. they often Radiant feel compelled, it seems like, by some mystical voodoo to go for high meta solutions that work Dial in pubs, back. not the solutions that they are used to running, not the solutions that they as a team can execute. So I really hope we see Alberta avoid that and really go into their comfort zone, hit their pocket right away. Yeah, as far as the bans coming out from them, um, Golgi's not convinced, but I, I swear I'm seeing so many Enchantress bans first phase these days. Ten seconds remaining. Is is yeah, this something that you expect to see, or is this kind of... Is this irregular? You know, I don't recall seeing a whole ton of Enchantress bans, except against very specific players, right? Um, recently in... Pro Dota, but I could just be missing the games. As for CSL, I think this is the first Enchantress ban that I've seen, um, at least this semester. Ten seconds so, remaining. but but you'll notice that they're actually just banning all split pushers, right? It's uh, Enchantress, remaining. Nature's Prophet, and the Naga Siren. So they're looking to probably do a, a death ball strategy here, and they don't want to give any potential for split pushing. I'd be surprised if they don't ban a Tinker in the next phase. Yeah, Stony Brook is a lot more standard with their bands, Clockwork and Sand King. Now, Naga at the high levels of play have been has been seeing tons of play recently. Mm -hmm. uh, so not surprising to see her. And then, um, you know, if that's someone who, if they're if they are going for that death ball and they don't close out that game right away, uh, as a support, you know, she still has that capability of going Radiance. Can make the game very difficult for them uh, in the later stages. Yeah, and she's one of the few heroes that's going to be able to reliably farm wall turtling. And that's the most dangerous thing to play up against if you are, especially an amateur squad, trying to play a fast game. Because going that high ground extra distance is the part where most teams' communication struggles the most. Most teams' understanding of the game, you know, starts to hit a wall and, and, and peak at its limit. And if you have no room for error because your opponent is able to farm from inside the base, that means that you're Five not going to be able to get that pickoff that you need in order to breach that high ground. It makes a lot of sense to get rid of heroes such as Nagus Iron and Nature's Prophet if you are thinking about a fast uh, run. Now, that said, the Disruptor is not necessarily a hero that I would expect if I were looking for a death volley sort of strategy. He can fit that lineup, especially because he can force away heroes at TP to defend, which can be very nice. Uh, using that glimpse but overall you know he doesn't really do any significant tower damage nor does he really contribute a lot to that sort of wave push and same for nyx assassin yeah disruptor he's got a little bit of area denial in the kinetic field but it's there are other heroes that do it much better uh if they're going for their five a, a jakiro 
with them just laying down the macro pyre can be right. a good disincentive. Ten or seconds. the most common one right now is the Underlord uh, Pit of Malice, a powerful skill Five for area denial. Remaining. Yeah, I might have read this draft a little wrong. It's just, it's weird to me to see a Nyx Assassin come out in a game where you're banning uh, Enchantress and, and Nature's Prophet. I guess the Enchantress is okay because it's hard to, to just get through her necessarily. The Vendetta attack slow from Untouchable can be annoying. Um, but Nature's Prophet Dyer just crumbles back. to a good Nyx. He is not a problem if you have a Nyx Assassin on your team at any stage in the game. And, you know, we're seeing more pushers get denied here with Lone Druid. And once again, I'd, I'd be kind of surprised if we don't see a Tinker get banned out here as well. Dia team back. Yeah, the uh, the support of the patch, so to speak, is is has been that Shadow Shaman. He did get nerfs recently in the, the latest mini patch. But if this is what they're wanting to go for, which their bans absolutely tip their hand toward. And look, an Arc Warden as well. You would expect yeah. that they would pick up that Shadow Shaman. Ten seconds remaining. Yeah, well, you know, ultimately it looks like they're Five just... I don't remaining. think that they're making these bands based on their own strategy. I think they're making these bands based on what they are not comfortable playing against. Uh, they are not comfortable playing against a pushing-oriented lineup. The Shadow Shaman contributes to pushing lineup, but you still need to have the heroes that can sustain presence around the tower long enough for those wards to do the trick, which means you do need to have your Lone Druid or something along those lines with it, maybe a Death Prophet. And remaining. also, you know, the Shadow Shaman does not split push effectively because he puts himself remaining. in a great deal of vulnerability Radiant by being alone, pick. whereas all of the heroes on our left-hand side here in the bands are split pushing masters so really it seems like alberta are just worried about getting out maneuvered they're worried about getting ratted out and it looks like they're 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 picking a lineup where they really want to fight as a team remaining. and banning out stuff so even if they don't want to necessarily death ball uh, it looks like they remaining. they put a lot of value into forcing five on five engagements yeah I, which is once again that's a very strange way to draft if you are not drafting any tower damage so you know maybe we're gonna see uh, alina come out something you know a, a good light strike array on top of a ravage on top of a kinetic field on top of uh nyx assassins and pale could be a very nice combo and she actually has some tower damage once she gets her uh, fiery soul or whatever it is called these days i think they changed the title a couple it's years still ago fire. never yeah, fiery soul Oh, thank God. Okay. Every now and then, I, I just, I feel like my Dota knowledge is outdated, but fortunately, it didn't give away this time. Uh, yeah, I, I think the <coughs> Fiery Soul would give them some some tower damage as well. Uh, Lena's out. really popular here, though. Yeah, Lena's out for, uh, a lot right now. What's been really popular is the Dragon Knight. Uh, yeah. Either, either oh, we've seen him. You typically see him in the off lane, though, right? And that's probably where the Tidehunter is going to end up. Well, no, actually, Dragonite's been being played uh, mid as usual, oh, right. and you even can run some, him. You can even run some him cores, yeah, yeah, even even some position ones as well. I don't think the position epicenter. one would work well for them here. I mean, in part because the Witch Doctor's Maldict is really good against high HP heroes, uh, and in part because Life Sealer is also really good against high HP heroes. So I don't think that you want a tanky core here for as your side lane carry, but definitely in the mid, uh, you could. The Razor makes sense here. Um, very good into the Life Sealer, pretty good into the Tusk. Does give you some push and some wave clear, and also stacks on top of that Tide Hunter really well. Now, I think the Puck has already been banned out. It was banned out by yeah. Stony Brook. Um, that's usually a good vehicle for the Life Stealer. They might be looking for a uh, um, Storm Spirit here. Or Quap really has been a huge... Quap has yeah, actually been a huge a a yeah, hero for this patch. If they don't pick it, I suspect Alberta will probably look to ban that. You know, Quap's nice, too, because you have some options for knocking down a Nyx Assassin if he tries to vendetta himself away from a fight. Uh, she has a pretty decent amount of survivability for a blink hero once the game goes later and she starts to get some ultimate orb items up and, and really get some HP. So the Tide Hunter stun is necessarily going to be a killer. That's that Underlord you were talking about, and that does give quite a lot of potential split push. Uh, you do have some initiation with the Tuscar Snowball uh, Life Sealer combination, but right now we're still missing that big blink hero that you would normally Ten expect to see with a Life Sealer. 
five seconds and you know that me. could be your storm spirit as as you mentioned not the most popular hero right now but certainly would fit uh not great into disruptor though it could be that tinker that i had been talking about as a potential split push and also a vehicle for the life stealer uh it could be a handful of other heroes. you know we could even see maybe a ta or something like that come out ta really really good into the nyx assassin quite good into the razor um i don't know what are you thinking no i i agree with all the above points uh, storm spirit you know he's usually someone that you associate with life stealer but of course as he said and as we all know not super popular this patch quap is is i think the slam dunk here if it doesn't get banned um, but alternatives, the ones that you mentioned, Ooh, Ember Spirit ban. Ember Spirit, not a hero that I would expect to see banned, but the ban does make sense in a traditionalist way. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think the Quap or TA, as you had mentioned, are some of the more popular ones this patch and one of the staple heroes. Something we'll probably expect to see out of Stony Brook. Remaining. Yeah. It, that's five seconds remaining. It, so for me, the the one real question is. Can they get away with the TA into the Disruptor's damage over time? Because if they can, their tower push becomes really, really good. Like, they've got a lot of sustain with the Underlord to just sit at towers. They have a lot of defensive reinitiation with Tuscar and Witch Doctor sitting there. And TA is, is just able to chew through waves, and they can just sit there. Um, now, if Tidehunter does manage to get himself a Blink Dagger, that becomes a little more dangerous, but they should be able to chew through some towers if the beginning of the game goes well, well before Tidehunter has that initiation potential. And Alberta here, looking for their position one, I am struggling to, to think of something that's actually going to have an okay time against this lineup. Um, some of the more popular ones we've been seeing this patch are, of course, Sven has remained pretty staple. Seconds, With the Tidehunter, Disruptor stuff already on, on their team, Razor even, uh, I feel like they're probably going to go for something probably like a Juggernaut. You know, I, I would say if it's a position Shadow one, it's probably Fiend. Juggernaut. But it could also be a mid. So Shadow Fiend, not the hero that I would expect here. Um, yeah, if they plan to send this Razor in the safe lane as a position one, I think Quap, Quap has repeatedly shown herself as a great bully for the Shadow Fiend. Uh, even TA, yeah. as, as we mentioned, but over on Alberta instead of Stony Brook, uh, TA a big bully for Shadow Fiend as well. You know, an Invoker would be very good here if they have a strong Invoker player. Um, it gives you a lot of uh, ability to separate the, the life stealer from his team. It gives you a, a tremendous amount of uh, pushing potential that you, you're otherwise lacking. It gives you a lot more sustain, which means that the Nyx Assassin and Disruptor will be able to kind of pair up with the Tidehunter and the Razor in order to get some kills. So if it is a mid, uh, yeah, I well, we're about to see what it is, and it is at Quap. I, I think the Quap makes the most sense. Invoker, I would say, if they have the player, is, is pretty solid, too. I, I, I will say the Shadow Fiend, I honestly kind of expected to see a Shadow Fiend come out here for Alberta, so it's interesting that it ended up getting picked first by Stony Brook. Yeah, let me see. Looking at these teams here, the... Life Stealer, yeah, I guess really he's only got the uh, the Tusk Snowball, but Tusk is a great roamer. He's such a solid roamer right now, and we've seen I've seen amazing plays out of Tusk players this patch. Um, he's really back in a big way, and it's really exciting to see just the skill on some of these players and the way that they use those ice shards. And yeah, yeah, and he'll co he'll combine very well with the Life Stealer. So Life Stealer doesn't always need you know one of those vehicle people. Um, he can always just you know come in himself. Although he prefers not to. Right, and, and Tuscar, you don't need to use the invest in order to initiate with the Tuscar. You can obviously just snowball from Fog of War, which is a super, super valid option. You still have initiate a vehicle for him. The, the one important thing is that you can get him to the fight. Once you get him to Prepare the fight, it doesn't battle. really matter if he did it with Impale Blink or if he did it with Snowball or even if he did it with Tiny Toss, anything along those lines. He just has trouble sauntering up to opponents. Oops, and I'm sorry. Let me make sure I have the right team. Stony Brook is going to be on the right. Radiant. Alberta on the dire. Yeah, and we'll just go ahead and look at the way that these teams are maneuvering. We are going to have an aggressive push here. Probably a smoke, if I had to guess. No, maybe not. From dire? They're all just clumping up, but they did not bring a smoke. Interesting. 
Yeah, I don't think they're necessarily going to go for the first blood, but as we've seen repeatedly, uh, we've kind of transitioned into each team just kind of takes their respective half of the map, like this way instead of across the river. Yeah, I don't think that they're going to be offered that, though. They're, they're going to try to bully their way in, but Witch Doctor is really good at stopping these kind of bullies, uh, right? Because he's got the cast that can bounce onto three heroes, potentially, and mini-stun them long enough for the Life Stealer to potentially get away. Although Life Stealer did not save his first skill, so he could get into trouble if he tries to fight this out too much. He does not have Rage available. So yeah, let's see if they're able to bully their way in. Very yeah, they smart have Shadow the Strike on Queen. Oh yeah, Quap, she's just gonna show up and they're gonna have no idea this is coming now. Ling is getting static linked up. Lots of damage, the Impale coming out and catches him. A couple more shots. <laughs> pump, waiting for that. Yeah, pump faking on the auto attacks, so but make sure one of these cores gets it. Yeah, that was uh, that was a really good maneuver by the Quap though, to have her come down from the side. Not only did that kind of pump fake and make them think, oh, it's just a Quap, but it also kept all the heroes separated so that the Paralyzing Cast could land. If that Paralyzing Cast goes out, like I said, that, that probably goes a completely different way and the Witch Doctor just walks away from that fight. <laughs> did they also get the Bounty Rune? No, the Life Stealer did end up getting the Bounty Rune, so. But first Blood probably worth handing over that Bounty Rune, especially considering they were able to choose which core goes on. And Dire Courier goes down, which is also a very good fit. Where on earth did that get taken out? In the mid? I think Tuskar took it mid. Like, it was, it was like, out here. That is not where you want your Courier, typically. Yeah, I don't know what it was Sources doing say. there. Uh, yeah, sources say Courier should never be across the river. So, taking a look at the way these lanes break down, this aggressive tri-lane is, I think, a pretty good response to start, but you're going to run into trouble with the Nyx Assassin not getting enough levels to make it useful at a certain point, unless he's 100% landing his guns. They are having an okay time. Even a short static link in this early phase uh, means that Life Stealer can have a much worse time last oh, oh, here comes the cast. Bouncing back and forth as usual in Pale. On to three. Wow. Very nice. And even getting a uh, lightning strike out onto Ling Ling, taking quite a lot of damage. I can't help but think if that were a level one glimpse, that might have been killed. But there we go. Dead. This is those shards I was talking about. He's going to try and go for the TP. He actually makes it as the coconut flies back to the fountain. And we miss the kill on Nyx the Nyx. Does go down. Well, I, I miss kill on Nyx. It is non disjointable, so it will land. There it is. Yeah, so a 1-1, one, one, this, this exchange, I, I really do worry about this aggressive tri-lane. It should work out better in the first three levels than it will later on, just because the la the Razor is not going to scale tremendously well in this lane compared to the Life Sealer, because most of his damage potential is going to be coming out of Static Link anyway, so he needs to just get a lot of levels before that's going to scale up in a useful way. Uh, meanwhile, the Nyx Assassin is really dependent on getting a couple levels for that stun damage and, and also being able to have the survivability spike carapace up regularly enough to deal with the three on three. I don't know. It, it could go either way, but I do think that the advantage here is for Radiant. But the important thing is that they're slowing the Life Stealer down. That's the goal. As long as they can slow him down, the question then becomes who's mid laner wins. And the Quap, I think, has a pretty serious advantage in this lane. Absolutely. And then as far as utility goes, we have Underlord and a Tidehunter just fighting up against each other. Both of these okay, guys... Bottom. Tusk way out over in the side shop. Gonna get found Die. and downed. He got a static link just before he tried to snowball out and then glimpse back with that level 2 glimpse. And that glimpse is really powerful in this specific lane because they really don't have any other air form of control other than, once again, that Nyx stun that he did manage to land a three-man earlier, but that's probably going to be unreliable. So, Gorgon, in the uh, in the offlane matchup, actually, Underlord doing significantly better than Tide, but I would expect that, for the most part, this lane might be a bit of a wash, both guys getting the same amount. Uh, given the same amount of levels in gold, who are you more afraid of in these lineups? The Tide Hunter, maybe having the... Uh, Mech and a blink. Oh man, another death onto the Nyx Assassin. Yeah, he's really struggling. <laughs> this, this once again comes right back around to the fact that he is a super level dependent uh, support. Does not do well in the early game. 
if he's not setting up kills, and it's very difficult to set up kills in the three on three. But back to your question about the top lane, you know, I would say that the the Underlord comes into this with maybe a little bit of a level advantage, or excuse me, a little bit of a lane advantage, just because of the the potential Firestorm. of the attribute. Aura. Oh yes, that as well. Um, you know, if he's in a lane alone and just able to, to force a bunch of creeps down, he can't really be harassed out of the jungle if he goes in to pump that Atrophy Aura up. It doesn't necessarily matter that that Angel Smash is there. Although, I say yeah. that as... And he's getting absolutely beat up right now. Zero taking a lot of damage from the creeps. He's going to have another Anchor Slash. He's going to be... <laughs> splash. He's going to be able to get it onto Zing. And one thing I've noticed is that Zero actually... Between good use of the bounties and great denies, look here he is again. Um, he's significantly out leveling this uh, this underlord. Yeah, and that's a huge win because now that the underlord is also missing a wave of experience, this could have been a tough lane for the Tide Hunter. He does have the damage reduction of the anchor smash in order to control the lane, which gives him a lot of one-on-one -on -one potential to avoid harass. But he doesn't have a good way to force the force the underlord out of lane in, I would say, an equally skilled matchup, but I, I think that Zero is honestly just playing better. Salitos is hanging out in the back line. Now they're gonna shard him up, caught inside. Here comes the Snowball. We've got a TP in from Disruptor. Disruptor's gonna be fine. Zero even going on the aggressive now. Zero has the Ravage. They get the Thunder Strike onto him. Now they're gonna glimpse him back. Plenty of damage, even dropping the Ravage. Now they can get the Tusk as well. No body blocks up onto him, but they don't have, I don't they think they have anything else. They've already used the just the, uh, the glimpse. Now Zero's oh gonna have to God, go eat the tower for a bit. This, this, does he have a wand? Oh my God, that was, those creeps almost blocked him in too. That, he was two tower hits away from dying there. Honestly, if the Tusk had just turned around and taken that bite, he might've been able to make a trade with the snowball. Tide is going to be able to just get himself back up without going all the way back to Fountain, though, which is important here. And immediately upon seeing that, his allies are gone. Ling is oh, Razor, gone. yeah. Oh, he's just keeping out. Still and he will not in, they will be able to get him out. No. Get him out of the TP, yeah. I mean to say. Zero TP from the bottom. What does this help with this? Oh, Shadow, uh, Shadow Fiend going down in the mid quad. Very low. But that is kind of what we expected from that lane. Yeah, a lot of action all over. It, the story of this mid game is probably going to end up becoming, hey, which mid did the best and is able to throttle control? Because the lanes on either side are kind of pushing one way and then the other way. Radiant are ahead pretty substantially in terms of net worth, or excuse me, in terms of creep score, but they're not ahead in terms of net worth, really, in any significant way. The, the, the Life Stealer's got about a 500 gold lead over his next nearest opponent, Flop. But other than that, it's even all the way down the board. Yeah, but the co I mean, one thing is that we expect that the co-op to, the, the lane matchup expects that the co-op wins this lane pretty substantially, right? Uh, but Shadowfiend is having the time of his life. Yeah, and I, the part of that comes down to the fact that the co-op lost her courier earlier, right? She needs to have that early model. She needs to have her early items. She needs to be able to upgrade her wand. And sub three minutes is a huge, probably the most important time of the game. Oh, and Kel gonna miss top on Zing. Zing trying to turn around. Oh, but they have so many people here. He thinks he's tankier than he is, and it was going so deep. There's three yeah, heroes I, here. He also is not as leveled as maybe he thinks that he is, because he's just catching up to the Tide Hunter. You know. Uh, speaking of the Tide Hunter, he's trying to one on one against a Life Stealer down here. Life Stealer did end up using his ultimate in that though. If they decide to move down here, he's really got no way to save himself. There's a Ravage coming up cooldown. This could be a good bait. Life Stealer expects that Tidehunter won't be able to do much to him, but if they have some people waiting in the wings, this could be an easy pick. They just don't. They did smoke up the Nyx Assassin and the Disruptor, and it looks like they're looking for a kill near mid, but they're just going to spend maybe 90 seconds wandering around with absolutely no avail. Yeah, this would be a great time for an, a vendetta, but as as you said, Nyx just having level problems right now, and he desperately needs those levels. Dyer's top tower yeah, and they're just they attack. are just waiting here in the mid lane. Um, hopefully, they don't lose the razor while their supports are just sitting and waiting for Shadow Fiend. But the the fact that they are not able to move on the Shadow Fiend right now too is really painful because he has just got himself back up to the max twenty eight souls after that last death. 
and they could really use the benefit of, you know, taking Keeping him down. Um, yeah. Well, Shadow Fiend has shown back up in the mid just as Disruptor is rotating away. Nick's probably not going to hang around here too long either, so perfect timings from him and unfortunate timings for the Dire uh, supports. All right, yeah, and Dire is really struggling to make anything happen here, and this is not what you want in a match where your Nyx Assassin is only level 4 at 10 minutes. Your Disruptor still level 4 at 10 minutes. And we're going to have a pause here. Uh, taking a look like... I guess the Tuscar is still only level 3, which is... But he gets a lot more done with yeah. 2 or 3 levels. All, all he needs is a Snowball and an Ice Shards. He's good to right. go. Regardless of the damage, like, they, they do way more than their damage, right? Uh, yeah, it's all about control. And at this level, Nyx Assassin doesn't reliably contribute that. The Disruptor does to some degree but he is maxing thunderstrike and although that gives vision the damage is not really going to be that significant of a contributor to most skill attempts boy i could really use some food delivery pizza are they sending it to everyone or yeah let me check my grubhub see if they had they went ahead yeah, and I'm... fulfilled my my order request <laughs> so so heads up about my casting situation my computer is in my kitchen so I'm sitting next to my food, unable to eat my food while they're talking about food. And I, I've got to say, it's uh, not ideal. I have to say, that is an interesting uh, PC setup. You know what? It, it's important to be reaching distance away from the refrigerator at any moment in your life, is my stance. If my apartment were bigger, I'd need to own a mini fridge. It'd just be a big, it'd be a big mess. So I prefer to just sit right next to the fridge so I can always get a drink. I can always get a carrot. Whatever you need, you know? Gorgon, now here's the, here's the important question. Is this a studio apartment and you're just choosing to describe it very strangely because it's all one room? No, this is a one-bedroom apartment, but it is, it is mostly one room, right? I have a bedroom, a bathroom, a hallway, and then, like, a living room attached to the kitchen. And, and I've put my computer on the kitchen side of the living room. Is it because that's where the counters are and you just don't have room for a table or desk? Uh, it's because I own a pinball machine. Oh, there you go. Large, and you need to have space for them. And, you know, uh, my girlfriend and I are very uh, active pinball players. We need to make sure there's enough back space in the apartment so we don't, like, push the machine around too much or anything. Uh, so, you know, we've moved literally all of our furniture into a corner and my computer into the kitchen. And the pinball machine is the centerpiece of the room. <laughs> hey, that's priorities, man. And it's a good thing you both have that passion because I feel like that would be a very contentious point in a relationship otherwise. Yeah, that's really a make or break if you're not both really <laughs> into the thing. You know, like, hey, honey, I'm going to have this child's game uh, instead of furniture. How do you feel about that? Is not a conversation I think most couples would love to have either direction. But yeah. Honey, you know the, the shower tub thing. combo? Um, we have a hose, and that's, like, exactly the size of a pinball cabinet. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, but anyway, now, talking about the game here, just taking a look at some of the items that we've got coming out. We are very close to Armlet for the Life Sealer, which is probably the word go for him in terms of pushing his first tower. And then we'd probably expect him to lighten up until he gets his second item as well. Uh, you usually want to see, like, Echo Saber Armlet or Armlet in addition to one other damage potential item before that life sort of gets super active. And that would also give time for the Underlord to get that mechanism up. Which and he is pretty time. close to, and, and yeah. when they get those two, that is going to be huge power spikes for their team. Yeah, the Underlord is actually closer to the mechanism than the Tide Hunter somehow, despite the fact that I, I think that we can unambiguously say the Tide Hunter one is laying pretty handily. Got a lot of pressure stacking up here on the top lane. They're going to use the pit. There go the shards as well. They've got the coconut and mallet onto him, but they're just forced. Look at those TPs. Great coordination there from Alberta. They've been waiting for an opportunity to have an engagement. Unfortunately, though, the one little misstep is that the next TP first, so you couldn't get the disruptor for glimpse. Maybe he's going to be able to salvage it here. He comes around to the south side. Oh, no, wow. he doesn't find the Underlord. Oh. Uh, that's really unfortunate. That that could have been that kill moment that they've been waiting for oh so long. Like two parallel lines 
flirting so close to each other, but we'll never touch. <laughs> uh, and once again, this mid lane just becomes a one-on-one. -on -one. It's pretty rare to see this little... Oh, here we go. Put a Malice out on the Razor. Razor's trying to juke away another set of Maledicts on him, but it's going to bounce back to him three times even. What a beautiful circumstance. Now Disruptor is going to be the target of their aggression. Easily gets taken down there. They already have an earn up. Sonic Wave goes out. It's going to catch all three of them. Now damage into Underlord. Already took down the Tusk. He's going to try. There we go. Coconut bouncing back and forth as he uses that Rift to get the hell out of dodge. Yeah, and the Queen of Pain is actually looking to find the Witch Doctor, hoping that he's going to the Shrine, but he's not. She will back out. I was just about to say, it's it's rare to see a game where the mid lane has this. Oh, Ravage used it to oh, wow. the Shadow Fiend. They're immediately following up with the Razor and the Quad. Everyone just collapsing on the mid, knowing he felt so safe knowing everyone was up top, but didn't realize everyone was collapsing onto him very quickly. Yeah, that, that fight stopped up top. Why oh, glimps out onto Tusk even. Tusk is gonna snowball, he's going out onto Zero. The Tidehunter may be able to make his way away. They get a nice pit. It's, oh, beating up Zero. Zero's gonna go down with one more shot. The Anchor Smash even. Or no, no, sorry, the uh, Underlord with all of those Pit of Malice stacks. That was a bit ambitious, I will say. Yeah, yeah they probably shouldn't have gone past that tier one and taken the victory where they could. Disruptor gets himself denied the neutrals though. That's nice. If you're gonna die, you might as well die in style. And now the, the Shadow Fiend able to just try and catch his souls back up. Yeah, that Shadow Fiend earlier on was tricked by his Avarice. He thought he could get that tier 1 tower, but he didn't really even get very close. Should have backed up and then waited for his team to create some more distractions. Up until that point, there had been very few rotations from either team into the mid lane of any substance. Really just one. They will claim it. Nyx does have his level 6. He's got his vendetta. He's out scouting. He finds a courier. Nom nom nom. And that had the mechanism rest. Oh, that is. Without mechanism for Underlord. That is beautiful. That is exactly the kind of space they needed. Oh, Razor's going to get caught inside of an ice shard. Everyone dogpiles onto him. No chance. You know, if you're not doing damage to your opponents, it doesn't matter if they don't have mechanism, so... They, they really need to be playing around their cooldowns a little bit better, right? Uh, they need to make sure that they are in safer positions until the Ravage is available, and then taking fights at that point. And Lifestealer's been left essentially alone. Now. And he is going to go for Sanjin Yasha as a second item. Once again, I would really expect him to be very, very active. Here's that first tower I talked about now that he has Armlet. And he goes down. And he's probably just going to jump back into the jungle until his full Sanjin Yasha. Uh, Coconut out on the Queen of Pain. They're going to get the Static Storm down. But no one is caught inside of it. Tusk now going to snowball onto the Nyx. Nyx gets caught. Bug stomping that boy. And the Shard's actually going to make a safe retreat here for the Dire. Unless really your name is Queen of Pain and you're hanging around, and maybe you shouldn't. There we go. Blinking out. Can I feel going to use by a little rather. bit of space? They use open wounds onto Disruptor. Disruptor taking so much damage right now. He will be the sacrificial lamb while everyone else tries to get out. Tidehunter making his way away with Queen of Pain. Queen of Pain. Oh, no. Drops her veil now. They've got a coconut out on Tidehunter. Eaten. Oh, he perfectly timed. Perfect timing on the Kraken shell. It's going to buy him a little bit of space. Ravage goes out. It's onto two Sonic Wave. Masquerade is under the tower taking some shots, but they're just going to re rip everyone the hell out of there. And this should be... A very safe retreat. Very well done. That honestly felt like an unnecessary rift to me. Am I am I crazy, or could they have just walked away there? Yeah, I guess. I mean, rift is a skill that, especially in this early game, you're not going to be using it that much. I think so. You know, just, yeah, just keep everyone together to and safe. Out from the fountain, right? Like this is all dead time now. Nobody on in the game is using any of this time. <laughs> It's just, it's its not the worst case in the world. Like, like it's good that they got away, but, you know, the Tusk is still level 5. It, he missed two waves of experience because he didn't walk away and go into jungle or whatever. That's going to slow down his progression, and now the Nyx is, is ahead of him. Speaking of Nyx, he's very active right now. He's going to find a double damage rune, not take it. He doesn't but he's going to find a Witch Doctor. Give it away. Yep. Oh, but he's going to find a Tusk as well. And a life stealer, and they're gonna oh, smoke no. up. He saw the smoke, I think, and he, the smoke gets popped. Actually, masquerade. 
So and yeah, the, the, he didn't see the smoke, and also the smoke was popped on the life stealer while he was on high ground. So they don't actually know that this smoke. Okay, there we go. Maledict on the tide hunter. Tide hunters being very unhappy about this. Plenty of damage coming out. They've got the water punch and the snowball. Catch him in the pit. And they just be able to run him down. One more tick of Maledict would have done him in, even if he got away there. Really, really good play there. And very uh, fortuitous for Radiant that that smoke was not seen because it was nighttime. And then the smoke reveal was not seen because of high ground. Uh, and they didn't even have any idea, any ability to know that they might have been seen because the Nyx was invisible. It just all barely fell into play for them. Really no defense here without the Ravage. They might try to land a stun. This is really dangerous to engage on without the Ravage. Right, here comes the Nyx once again. Oh no, Queen of Pain going to be the first one spotted. She's getting run down right now. They drop a pit into him and catch Ling. Ling still alive for now though. He's setting the heals up. Rays are going to drop the current out. And there we go. Ling finally getting chased down. They're going to use the Reality Rift. Oh, we'll be able to glimpse back the Tusk and get a second one out of this. But objectives just continually going down. And very quickly, I think Stony Brick is going to start chasing, choking out this map. I don't think that I've seen Witch Doctor ulti at this game. We have Trying not. Only level six, but that was a fight where if he just dipped into these trees up here, that that's probably an unstoppable ult after the impale was already used. Um, you know, the, the Disruptor would have needed vision for the glimpse. I guess he could have dropped Static Storm. He didn't have to use that, but he would have had to have a good idea where Witch Doctor was and would have had to spend a Static Storm. I don't know. Maybe, I guess it's not the end of the world that that ultimate didn't get used there, but it is a little weird that they're trying to take engagements and they don't feel comfortable putting the Witch Doctor on the back line and just getting some damage. Here we go. Oh, Disruptor taking many much damage. Tries to TP out, but won't make it today. Yeah, that is just about the Sanjinyasha for the Life Stealer, and of course we did see in that last fight and the fight before the mechanism is done on the Underlord. The Courier Kill did buy enough time for the Tidehunter to also get a mechanism around the same time, which in, is in and of itself a huge win. But yeah, I uh, I really don't know that U of A are in a position that they need to be in to, to take a strong stance in this mid game. What they really need is a big Ravage win fight. Uh, if they don't get that, they're going to continue to start to just atrophy out towers, atrophy out territory, and then they're going to struggle to catch up because Razor is not a great uh, flash mark. Quap going to be the target. She's getting snowballed right now. She's got a blink. Oh, she's just <laughs> absolutely booking it. Yeah. Even cutting the wave. Oh, look at this girl. Wow. And she knows they're not coming to her, so she's just going to hang out and TP. And the space that she's creating is allowing the Tidehunter to push a wave up here to this tower. He can probably knock this tower down, maybe even bait out a fight. Uh, everybody will need to TP in here if they want to defend this. He's got some pals behind him, too, that if no one shows up, they could... Uh go on them but of course underlord a great deep pusher with that uh with that wave fire yeah, they storm. also they don't have any vision on anybody right now and i guess they're just not comfortable not knowing where radiance uh backup is yeah taking a look at some of our items running down there is the urn of shadows on the witch doctor that we haven't mentioned sanjan yasha also done on the shadow fiend with the drums of endurance strange I, I don't know. Have you seen the Sanjin Yasha build recently? Because I feel like I've not seen Radiant's it in a couple of times. Not on... I have not been watching as much as I used to. Not on Shadowfiend specifically, but we have been seeing it in a lot of teams that are looking to just uh, take, like, win early. Uh, punish the early game. They're not looking to take this late. Um, they just want to build lots of cheap items and win the game. Yeah. I, I, they are getting decent advantages at this stage in the game, but I can't help but wonder if they would be better off, you know, sowing so that they can reap later rather than reaping now. You know, a more traditional Shadowfiend build might give them a better overall mid-game stance, even if they're getting two of kills right now. There we go. He's going to catch two. Tidehunter's out front. He's waiting to use the Ravage, trying to pump it. There he goes. He's going to drop it as the Static Storm goes down and catches the Witch Doctor. Now they're 
jumping up on everyone else, but not a significant amount of damage done. The control wasn't necessarily enough. They're gonna Vendetta gets used on the life stealer. Life stealer takes quite a lot of damage. They will be able to get the open wounds on the life stealer or onto the Nyx, and he's able to heal up a little bit from that. Now catching the disruptor here in the ice shark. Dark Raider gonna get that last raise onto him, and now Keo. This is basically just an I can find you leash to him. The rest of the team, are they going to be able to close the distance? No, I don't think they have enough people. So he will be able to make it to the high ground. One more raise to send him off. And that that might be a... be a good situation to have a, I don't know, Blink Dagger or Cyclone Staff or something, for example. Uh, that That is the tr problem that, that this hero traditionally struggles with, is that if somebody wants to run away from you, they're probably going to. Well, they're going to turn it straight into a Roshan kill. They got a nice couple of kills there. Not a lot they can do about it and have plenty of the damage that they need. So, yeah, Lifestealer, Lifestealer and the Shadow Fiend, both with Sanjin Yasha's here. Yeah, they, they're really looking to, to knock down some towers and, and get something done. So, I will say that remembering back to the draft with all those push bands, clearly there was some research done here and U of A had a set. No, you, SBU was the one banning all the split push. So yeah, this, okay, does fall into basically- No, 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 that was Alberta. Alberta was- Was it uh, Alberta? Okay. Yep. So Alberta did, did then do some research and get a read that SBU really do like to do this very aggressive push oriented style. And that must've been why those bands uh, were so highly prioritized. Yeah, they were they were mostly banning split push, which may be Alberta's typical style, or excuse me, Stony Brooks. Um, but they're just going, reg they're going death ball at this point with their builds at least. Uh, they're not trying to split; they're just fighting as a team. And and I was expecting that Alberta would really be the ones that are comfortable fighting. All right, Static Storm is dropped. It's going to be on the Shadow Fiend. Shadow Fiend just holding his ground and fighting away. They've got a Static Link up. Kyo, seventy-seven damage stolen. He's ready to hold the high ground with it. They're not going to push, so they get another wave. But they do have that uh, Aegis, so they are very comfortable sending Shadow Fiend up to the top, getting that vision and letting us, everyone else just beat into the tower. Now here comes the Vendetta. It's just going to be actually an Impale used out on a Shadow Fiend. Catch many of them with the Ravage, but they're turning it around. They pop the Shadow Fiend, but he's going to be back in a second. They've already lost their Nyx. Now Static Link going out on a Masquerade. Masquerade gets Glimpse back. They're ready to fight, Dark Raider. Oh, they dropped the Death Ward on the high ground, but they have no creeps here. This would be the perfect time to fight with that going away, and he actually cancels the channel, so it's going to be gone prematurely. They get the Tier 3, and this is their goal. They're just going to back out of here as soon as they can. There we go, once they have their underlook. No, it's a re-engage. They've got the Walrus Punch out onto the Disruptor. Disruptor gets taken down. Now they know how many of them are down, and the Coconut is just bouncing back and forth. Gets the Titan Hunter now. Kyo trying to get back to the fountain. They're going to force buybacks even out of this. Now they might be cost. It might cost them their Ling, but they're happy to sell that price. I think that earlier they were trying to disengage. And this might be the time to do that now, but actually, they're gonna no, stay. They, they're, they're absolutely no fine. Swap down and, and ravage down. There's no threat, and, and you can just see that they they want to fight. No, they're, they're gonna, gonna catch the assassin. Nix didn't have Carapace up in time. Was just barely coming up cooldown. Dark Raider punching away in Tide Hunter. They've got the melee barrack, and now are in a good spot to start going into the range if they want, or even transition to the mid lane. They're gonna use the rift and get everyone the hell out of there. Oh, they're going to get everyone to straight to the yeah. mid, of course. You of know, course. once again, as long as Ravage is down, there's really no threat to them. And they, they are being very smart about this, right? They saw the Ravage. They might have even timed the Ravage. They're going to go going get for the shrine. two shrines and tier twos, pushing in every lane on their way there. This is, this is textbook. Dyer's bottom shrine has fallen. Yeah, they might not be aware that the Ravage is still not up yet. 30 seconds is is a little on the close side for them, and they're simply going to want to take a pick off. Oh, oh there we go. Disruptor's going to get caught in those ice shards. Ice shards make you sad. The Nyx is just sitting and waiting for an opportunity. There is no gem nor any vision except a dust of appearance on the Witch Doctor. So. 
I'm surprised the shards are catching gonna Razor. Good. They're going to throw the pit, get two, send Masquerade to the high ground. He's a tanky boy. He's got his Dessa up as well, so these towers will absolutely melt. Oh, Nick's Assassin, he throws his Impale. I don't know if he was expecting his team to come help, but he gets just completely removed. Uh, oh, Ravage goes out. It's three, but they don't have anyone here putting the damage out. Wreck me up. It's going to lower the damage of all those hit. They get the Razor, and this should be a very, very short end rest of the game. They got buybacks, but no Ravage. Ravage is already down, and they accomplished nothing with it. Now Static Storm is going to catch a couple inside. Life still eating some damage, but this is just not doing enough damage at this point. Or the, uh, the Sonic Wave not doing enough, enough damage. They get a Maledict out on a Queen of Pain. Roll onto the Disruptor. Queen of Pain's going to be forced to back out. They get themselves a return kill on the Tusk, but it is going to cost them another set of racks. And they will very quickly transition this into the bottom, I think. I don't think there's much of a way to stop them. Once again, the Dark Rift just pulling everyone out of here. This time to the Fountain. That was a very successful series of pushes. And honestly, it felt like U of A's mentality there started to crumble. Like they're... they're composure did not stay the, the team the knicks got impatient they'd been under such constant pressure for so long that they may just as a team not have been able to stand up to the pressure yeah i think that's exactly as you mentioned that that really shows the point where their composure is unraveling the knicks uh just throwing an impale solo in the middle of the team uh, of course immediately gets blown up and then the Tidehunter going down and, and using a Ravage on everyone that was spread out. Oh boy, Nyx is going to get caught here. They're trying to fight up, but they're doing an expedition here with two heroes. They're just going to get caught. Now they get the root of the Queen of Pain and they have all the damage that they need. Yeah, and, you know, without Quap, there's no fighting this. No Quap and no Ravage for 45 seconds. They're going to lose this tier 2 immediately. They're probably going to lose it. Oh, really look at the damage again. they did to that disruptor. And if, if anybody on the dire side gets even a little impatient here, the game's just over. Although, speaking realistically, this game seems like it's over anyway. There's really no significant wave clear for them. So against two lanes of supers, they would need to drag this game out for a very, very long time, let alone each mega. Yeah, the amount of just... You know, they don't have that, that typical tower pushing, but with the Deso up and obviously the damage from Shadow Fiend, there we go. Mega Creeps are going to be... Oh, no. <laughs> they still have their range racks at the top. Dark Raider will go take care of that. He's just going to leave the rest of the team to run a distraction play. But Amalus goes out. They're going to catch Tidehunter. Not even trying to engage or fight right here. There we go. They've got their Shadow Fiend back. Three man Impale, and they're going to use the Ravage into four. But are they going to be able to return with anything? No, they drop the pipe, they drop the mechanism. Here comes the Requiem doing a little bit of damage. Lifesteal is just going to chase down Disruptor and blow him up. Now even catching Razor before he can get to the fountain. GG, well played, it's called. That was a yeah, long... There's nothing to do at that point in time. I'm not sure if you pulled up the uh, net worth or, or gold, but at about 23 minutes, it just... Shot up, and that's when you really started to see those uh, towers go down. You really started to see the map control go the way of Radiant. Yeah, let's take a look at that net worth graph right now. Yeah, that's that 23 minute mark. It is probably one of the sharpest corners I've ever seen on a uh, on a on a graph that wasn't a gold swing. You know, this right, is just yeah. them. That's just them taking control of the game. There there were maybe a couple of kills involved in that, but it really wasn't kill-driven. Uh, and that that's the really important part there. Uh, it, it was all about just posturing. Now, uh, how did Alberta start losing control of that game? It seemed like they had, especially in the mid, a matchup that should have been favorable. Um, but even though they got an early kill on the Shadow Fiend, he still was doing fantastic in CS. Um, and then the other lanes, we expected we expected Underlord to come out on top. Uh, but then the tri-lane situation, what was kind of your take on that again? So I think the tri-lane, the whole point of that tri-lane was to slow down the lifestealer so that the mid would be the pace setter for the game, right? If you, if you kneecap both of your carries, both yours and your opponents, your mid and your offlaner then become the most important heroes in the mid game. So 
I think that it was part of a calculated strategy not to win the lane, but just to make everyone lose the lane. Unfortunately, I don't think that their supports uh, really fed into that. For one thing, they didn't have any heals in that lane, which made it very difficult for them to sustain. And for the other thing, they had very level dependent supports in that lane, which does not bode well for an aggressive try lane. And the other thing is really, as you mentioned, we expected Queen of Pain to handily win her lane. And, you know, she did by traditional metrics, but she really did not maximize her use of that through the mid game. The Shadow Fiend was left alone in that lane for an extremely long period of time after the mid game gank failed around 10 minutes remember the smoke and wait attempt from the nyx assassin the disruptor after that they didn't go out to try and kill him again for a very very long time and they just let him catch up and similarly the tide hunter as soon as he got a couple kills and got control of his lane he tp bottom to one-on-one -on -one with the life sealer which is not a, a lane that he's going to win at that stage in the game and he allowed the Pit Lord to catch back up to him. So they kind of threw away all the advantages that they had sowed, but kept all the disadvantages while simultaneously just really picking very strange engagement types, like waiting extremely long times to try and get a single pick off, stuff like that. Do you think, is there any draft tweaks that you'd want to see for, uh, for Alberta, or do you think this is handily in their decision-making and their gameplay? I would really just like to see them play something easier to execute. I, I don't know exactly what the victory conditions for this lineup look like, other than every time Ravage is up, you win a big fight, and then you capitalize. That's a very difficult game plan. Like, it's simple. It's a one, you know, elevator pitch line strategy, and that, you would think, makes it easy to execute, but always at making sure that you're available to fight around Ravage and always making sure you're dropping that Ravage on your opponent's side of the map so that you're able to then push into towers. Very difficult to execute in reality, especially when Stony Brook had such a good pulse on when that Ravage was up and when it wasn't. So for Alberta, would you say it definitely wasn't one big exposed glaring flaw like a you know an open exhaust port you can fire a proton torpedo down? It was just a a, uh, a sequential series of smaller, um, more manageable things, but just all together, um, just the combination of them kept getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, they felt less like a fully operational battle station and more like one under construction. So I wouldn't say that it was the <laughs> exhaust port so much as it was the lack of the shield generator. Of course, of course. They need to get their Ender 4 nearby so that they can actually make sure that they are protected. On that, I don't think we can add anything to this. On that note, I'm going to send you guys to a short break uh, while we wait for the next lobby. We'll see you in a moment. 